Welcome to our program today, uh, Improving Hyperkalemia Outcomes and Opportunities for Pharmacists. The faculty today, and I am uh, Eric Cannon with uh, Select Health in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we are also joined today by Dr. Grabe, who is at the Albany College of Pharmacy in New York. Uh, on this slide, you can see our disclosures. As for program information, today's program is approved for one CPE credit. Uh, you can download a PDF of the presentation under the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen under the headshot. Uh, if you have a question throughout the program, please type it in the box located in the lower left of your screen. All questions will be answered uh, in the last 10 minutes of the presentation. Uh, you will be redirected back to the landing page after the webinar to complete the post-test and evaluation. You can then download and print uh, your certificate. The program is provided by North America Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, an HPM company. The program is supported by an educational grant from Relapsa. Learning objectives, identify at-risk patient populations by comorbid disorders, and use of medications known to increase serum potassium levels. Review latest clinical data to evaluate the mechanism, safety, and efficacy of all available potassium binders and develop strategies to integrate this information into pharmacy protocols. And then finally, provide relevant information and recommendations to inform discussions with patients, clinicians, and formulary committees. With that, we'll move into uh, the first part of the presentation that I have today, uh, where we'll talk a little bit about the burden of hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia is an important uh, electrolyte imbalance. Uh, it, it's commonly seen, most commonly seen probably in chronic kidney disease, uh, but it's also associated with diabetes mellitus. Uh, we know that many of the drugs used to treat cardiovascular disease will also cause hyperkalemia, and then uh, acute kidney injury is also a cause of hyperkalemia. When we look at the epidemiology and cost of hyperkalemia, uh, in the general population, we know that there were about 76,000 visits uh, to the emergency department in 2014. 46% uh, of those patients ended up being admitted uh, to the hospital uh, with an average length of stay of 3.3 days and a cost per stay of about $30,000. If we look at chronic kidney disease, some of these things are going to depend on the severity and also on the definition. You can see on the table over on the right-hand side of your screen, as the, the GFR goes down, we've got a higher percentage of patients that end up in that high range uh, of potassium levels. So uh, when the, the GFR drops below 30, we've got 1.8% of patients that end up above six and almost eight, 7.6% of the patients that end up uh, in the 5.5 to 5.9 range. Uh, when we look at a retrospective analysis, so what, what does this really cost? Uh, and in looking at patients uh, from a retrospective claims analysis that was done between 2010 and 2014, almost 40,000 patients with 40,000 patients matched controls, what we saw was there was a $4,000 higher 30-day total health care cost and a $15,000, almost $16,000 uh, one-year total health care costs. So if we were to look at just total health care costs for one year, we literally almost double the cost experienced by patients with hyperkalemia. Let's look at utilization of resources in the United States. So in just about every category, inpatient visits, outpatient visits, emergency department visits, uh, when compared with match controls, we see higher utilization. Uh, you can see higher utilization in terms of, of one year, over a period of one year uh, in the emergency department of almost one visit per year compared to 0.5 visits per year. Uh, when we look at inpatient visits or inpatient stays, uh, 0.44 versus 0 0.19 within the matched controls. And again, on the outpatient visits, 
uh, almost 27 visits for the hyperkalemic patient versus 18 uh, for the MASH control. Preventable hospitalizations, and I think this is important uh, because when we look at inpatient encounters for ambulatory care, uh, sensitive conditions, so those things that we should be taking care of in the outpatient setting, uh, hyperkalemia, heart failure, malignant hypertension, volume overload, uh, all of those things are driving those inpatient encounters. One in four chronic kidney disease hospitalizations are linked to one of these conditions. And so something that could be taken care of in the outpatient arena. And so I think as we go further on into the presentation today and we talk about what pharmacists can do, uh, I, I think this is a, a, a critical component for us. And, and then really realizing that the majority of the encounters are related to heart failure and hyperkalemia. So what's the association between serum potassium and mortality? And you can see that uh, based on the graph here we've got on the screen, uh, as that serum potassium level increases and as we get above six, you can really see that we've taken a big jump in mortality levels. The same thing applies as we start talking about major adverse cardiovascular events, uh, and we do that again according to serum potassium levels as we move towards the right-hand side, as we move from potassium less than 3.5 to up above 6, again, we see a, a real critical jump in, in those major adverse events. With that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Greb. I had to talk about the pathophysiology of hyperkalemia and some of the treatments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cannon. Uh, we're going to uh, first discuss the pathophysiology of hyperkalemia uh, and how uh, those important concepts will influence uh, some of our decision points uh, later in this discussion. So in this slide, we have the uh, potassium balance in a normal uh, circumstance. And important to know what is normal so that we understand what is abnormal. We have approximately 3,500 milliequivalents of potassium stored intracellularly uh, with a small amount of potassium uh, in the extracellular fluid, which is what we actually measure in patients uh, when we do a potassium uh, concentration determination. Uh, on the left-hand panel, it has sort of normal um, circumstances, what the intracellular uh, cation concentration is compared to the extracellular uh, cation concentration. Again, a typical 70 kilogram man is going to have anywhere from 3,500 to 4,000 milliequivalents, uh, with again a small percentage of that as an extracellular component. Um, we want to think about what your typical doses are of a potassium supplement. So, in some instances, you may be looking at 10 to 20 milliequivalents of potassium uh, being dispensed uh, or taken on a regular basis. Our average U.S. Day diet is about 40, 40 milliequivalents per day, and that's actually lower than the recommended daily allowance. Um, so again, uh, most patients don't have um, an adequate amount of potassium. Now, what's appropriate about that is we uh, have an ability in the kidney to um, regulate potassium um, uh, quite nicely. Uh, in this graphic, um, which is borrowed uh, from an article a couple of years ago, uh, it's a simple review of how uh, some of those mediators um, interplay within the uh, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And so we have a number of interventions, therapeutic interventions, that will influence this pathway. Uh, and you'll uh, notice that they will impact uh, the renin levels, um, the uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme uh, function, as well as an aldosterone function. And so those therapeutic interventions include ACE inhibitors, angiotensin-2 receptor blockers, uh, renin inhibitors, and uh, also aldosterone antagonists. And each one of these uh, in, um, by themselves or in combination um, will have an influence on the amount of potassium uh, that is uh, regulated by the kidney. Now, it's important to also understand how potassium is eventually excreted in the urine. Most potassium is going to be reabsorbed uh, in earlier parts of the nephron. However, here we have a picture of the um, uh, tubule of the cortical collecting duct where uh, potassium secretion is uh, occurring. Uh, 
this is the principal cells uh, that line the tubule lumen of the cortical collecting duct. And uh, here what you'll see is um, in a simplified um, a picture here is sodium being reabsorbed in the uh, tubule lumen uh, through the principal cells uh, via these uh, epithelial sodium channels. Um, that will create a negative uh, charge along this uh, basal lateral membrane, uh, ultimately driving potassium um, secretion uh, into the tubule lumen, ultimately to be um, eliminated uh, in the urine. In addition to this, um, the amount of potassium secretion that occurs um, will um, be influenced also by the amount of chloride reabsorption that occurs uh, in between the uh, principal cells. Uh, the more chloride that is reabsorbed paracellularly um, will influence the total amount of potassium we secrete. Uh, so again, um, this negative charge along the basal lateral membrane creates electrochemical gradient uh, to secrete potassium. Now, what's interesting is that because of the influence of hormones and other regulators, this um, allows us to ramp up uh, the number uh, and the activity of the uh, sodium potassium channels uh, in the principal cells. Uh, in addition to that, tubular flow is that is the more um, uh, urine flow that occurs through the tubules uh, generates um, additional activity uh, along the principal cell. So the kidney can uh, increase and decrease the amount of potassium uh, excretion uh, quite substantially. It can limit it down to 10 milliequivalents a day when it needs to conserve, and it can increase excretion up to 400 milliequivalents a day, which is quite remarkable. So uh, long ago when I first started in the field, uh, one of the nephrologists I worked with uh, used to always say, hyperkalemia waits for no one. Um, and what he meant by that was the fact that even though you might measure potassium uh, a minute ago, um, it can change quite rapidly through changes uh, in the body, burden from uh, extracellular uh, sources and intracellular sources. And so uh, potassium is a very important uh, cation for us to monitor and, and pay attention to. There's a number of adverse um, consequences to this, including severe muscle weakness, electrocardiogram changes, conduction abnormalities, arrhythmias. Uh, and reduced urinary acid secretion. And so these uh, alterations can ultimately lead to um, uh, death and so an important thing uh, to keep in mind. So that's some background on the um, pathophysiology of how pot uh, potassium is handled. Uh, next, we'll switch into a, a little bit of gear and talk about some patients that are at risk for hyperkalemia. So as you might imagine, uh, much of this centers around uh, many of the drugs we use for common conditions. Uh, so for example, in hypertension, in heart failure, in diabetic nephropathy, we often use uh, drugs such as ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II uh, receptor blockers, aldosterone antagonists. And so these um, create obviously an interruption in how uh, patients normally handle potassium and put these patients at risk. And obviously the numbers of patients that have hypertension, heart failure, and diabetes uh, is quite substantial. So the burden of the total population is quite high. So let's just pick one of these and talk about hypertension. Um, what are our strategies? We might um, first, we might maximize the dose of one agent and then add a second agent. Uh, we might start one agent and then add a second before you get to the maximum dose of the second. We might start two agents and titrate the doses up. And we might even follow, of course, the DASH uh, diet, and that is the dietary approach uh, to stop hypertension. And each one of these is uh, fraught with some uh, risk in terms of increasing um, hyperkalemia uh, propensity. And so uh, if you maximize the dose, you're going to increase the impact on uh, an ACE inhibitor or ARB in terms of how it might increase potassium. Uh, if you're adding uh, two agents, again, um, those uh, two agents might influence uh, potassium uh, excretion. And then um, uh, the uh, dietary approach to stop hypertension sounds like a great idea in normal individuals, but in patients with reduced kidney function, uh, those diets are very high in um, fruits and vegetables, and subsequent to that, there's a high amount of potassium. So again, you need to uh, temper your enthusiasm sometimes about these diets uh, because in some patients it actually might be harmful. Now, uh, talking about heart failure, many years ago now, in 
about uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was a phenomenal study called RAILS, which looked at uh, the impact of spironolactone on heart failure. And these patients in this study uh, back then had severe heart failure, uh, and the study was terminated early because, as you see in this uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier graph, uh, the uh, incidental mortality when spironolactone was used in severe heart failure um, resulted in a 31% reduction in death which was a remarkable finding back then. And so uh, the implication of this is that patients with severe heart failure should be started on spironolactone. Well, guess what? That actually happened. And so if you look at the um, years prior to the RAILS study, the use of spironolactone was quite small, uh, relatively uh, compared to uh, after the study was um, published. So again, the study was published in 1999, and as you might imagine, the number of people interested in using spironolactone for these patients um, was substantially increased. And of course, so was the incidence of hyperkalemia. So again, a direct correlation to the increased use of spironolactone in high-risk patients leading to an expected outcome. The risk of hyperkalemia also associated with antihypertensive medication classes. Again, here we have um, relative risk and ratio um, for patients getting a potassium above 5 and relative risk of potassium uh, going above 5.5. And you can see um, predictably that ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and potassium sparing diuretics, uh, in addition to that, beta blockers will increase the risk of potassium uh, going above 5 as well as 5.5, whereas uh, expectedly diuretics that do not have a potassium sparing component to it uh, reduce the risk of uh, hyperkalemia. So if you look at this study uh, done a couple of years ago, they looked at a number of randomized clinical trials comparing uh, individual uh, agents, including its inhibitors, antitensin to receptor blockers, direct run inhibitors. There's a total of 33 trials, 22 of them or ACE inhibitors, and the rest are all outlined here. And 23 of them, almost 10% uh, had hyperkalemia in the dual group compared to 5% in the mono group. That's a still a quite a high number of patients that you are going to see in different clinical scenarios uh, that are going to have an increased risk of hyperkalemia. Uh, clearly, when you combine agents, when you combine agents within the RAS cascade, uh, the risk was quite high, a 55% increased risk of hyperkalemia, um, which, uh, again, is substantial. In my particular field, in chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury, um, you might expect that the kidney is responsible for the majority of the kidney excretion. Um, the reduction in kidney function is going to lead to an increased uh, risk of potassium uh, creeping above 5.0. And again, this is a slide of the proportion number of patients uh, relative to what the EGFR is. Um, and again, predictably, uh, depending on um, how you monitor the patient in terms of how many labs you might draw each year, uh, the risk of hyperkalemia is there. So let's take a look at uh, a particular case here. We have a 53-year-old man with uh, stage 3B CKD. His EGFR is 34 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared. He has type 2 diabetes, he has hypertension, dyslipidemia, and proteinuria. His current medication is um, sort of a standard uh, mix of meds you might expect with lisinopril as the ACE inhibitor, uh, along with other agents to control his uh, other diseases. And a recent laboratory um, results show that he has hyperkalemia and his potassium level is 5.5. So the question you might ask yourself is, what would, might you do? Well, if in this particular um, study uh, done by Chang and colleagues, um, they showed what happened if a patient ended up with um, a potassium greater than 5, and what would happen if their potassium went above 5.5. Uh, in a small percentage, there might be an emergency department visit compared to control, certainly an increase. Uh, they would certainly repeat the serum potassium, that might make sense because sometimes you have traumatic blood draws to increase and will increase potassium. A uh, percentage of them is going to get uh, a prescription for sodium polystyrene sulfonate. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Lower percentage, of course, um, with greater than 5 compared to greater than 5.5, but certainly uh, much above the control patients. You might uh, give a diuretic or increase the diuretic. You might stop the ACE inhibitor or ARB, you might decrease the dose, you might 
obviously DC, a potassium sparing diuretic, or decrease the dose. Um, clearly, in, in many instances, that was the culprit. But all of these um, changes uh, may impact negatively on the underlying disease state control and the management of that disease state. So um, one of the things that we need to think about is how can we uh, increase the chance that patients are going to be on the right dose of the right medicines for the diseases that they have. And so for our case study, uh, a gentleman who has diabetes and hypertension um, we might be very much interested in maintaining these therapies uh, to slow the progression of uh, heart disease, slow the progression of his kidney disease, and other vital organ damage. Uh, so clearly, we want to maintain these therapies, but this hyperkalemia influences negatively on our ability to accomplish that goal. So let's switch gears and talk about how we might manage hyperkalemia in this new age. So this uh, particular graphic shows the um, numbers of uh, studies that have been done um, with different agents uh, and different strategies to manage hyperkalemia. Uh, in the green uh, portion of this circle are observational uh, studies. The uh, pink and red will uh, represent the randomized control trials, and the blue uh, uh, color represents those studies that were non-randomized control trials. And um, the different agents here, you can see a proportion of these are on um, uh, sodium polystyrene uh, sulfonate or calcium polystyrene sulfonate agents, uh, reducing doses, giving temporizing agents, things like um, insulin, uh, calcium um, infusions, what have you, uh, maybe dialysis. These are all observational studies. In randomized control trials, you'll see that SPS, certainly uh, CPS, small number of randomized controlled trials compared to some of the other agents that are out here. Uh, and you can see that very early on at the, in this 2018 uh, paper, uh, the newer agents, uh, ZS9 uh, and Petiramir, uh, both um, have more studies um, uh, than the agent that has been on the market since the 1950s. So the current therapies for uh, acute and chronic management hyperkalemia include a number of things. Uh, I talked about these temporizing agents. These are things that you would give if a patient had severe um, hyperkalemia. Uh, they had uh, changes uh, in their electrocardiogram. Uh, we want to obviously protect the heart, protect the patient, um, take care of that life-threatening situation. And so in that acute scenario, uh, we would use agents such as insulin and dextrose, uh, beta agonists such as albuterol in some cases, uh, and um, in um, uh, cases where the kidney cannot respond appropriately, we may um, introduce hemodialysis uh, for that particular patient. Um, in addition to that, we have a, a number of agents that we give orally uh, and sometimes rectally uh, to control potassium excretion from the gut. Remember, going back to some of the concepts, um, uh, less than 10% of potassium is excreted in the gut. But we can certainly take advantage of that pathway and maximize it uh, so we uh, reduce the burden on the kidney in terms of increasing uh, potassium excretion. Uh, the original uh, agent uh, and most uh, familiar um, to the um, uh, to healthcare is the sodium polystyrene sulfonate, uh, also known as Kexlate. And uh, this agent has been around quite a long. We're going to talk about that. And the two newer agents uh, are uh, Batyramir and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. And we're going to talk about those as well. So first, our historical agent, and that's SPS. Uh, and so some of the um, relative details on this uh, drug are here. Uh, including its administration, it's available in different uh, forms, storage conditions, what the typical dose might be uh, in terms of the amount of resin. The administered dose might be one to four times a day, and the cost of a 450-gram jar is about $50 to $150. The problem with SPS is a number of things. Number one, there are no rigorous clinical trials to determine its efficacy and safety. It takes several hours for any impact on the serum potassium levels. So as, as such, it has a question, questionable utility in emergent hyperkalemia. Um, there are some questions whether or not it really works when it's not combined with sorbitol. When this drug first came out, it was a powdered form. It quickly caused quite a bit of constipation. And so 
uh, it was combined with sorbitol at that time, 70% sorbitol, uh, which is, uh, as you know, a non-absorbable uh, carbohydrate, which causes diarrhea, uh, at least treats constipation. And so there's some thought that the sorbitol alone probably has an impact on potassium. Uh, there are questionable safety concerns about this drug. Uh, there are a number of potential drug interactions, although not all at trials. Uh, and there are some issues regarding mixing it, uh, dosing, what the right dose is, and certainly a palatability uh, problem for patients uh, who describe it as drinking sand. So originally, uh, the approval of this drug was based on a study of 32 patients. And this is a screenshot of that original um, uh, patient uh, base. Uh, these patients were hyperkalemic. They were azotemic, meaning their BUN and creatinine levels were elevated. Uh, hemodialysis was not yet available at the time, uh, at least on a routine basis. Uh, and in that study, potassium went down by one milliequivalent um, per liter orally, and um, if it was given rectally, it went down by 0.8. Uh, the duration of therapy was quite long, anywhere from one day to 280 days. The oral dose ranged from 10 grams three times a week to 60 grams a day, and the rectal dose had a, um, quite a bit of a range as well. So uh, not a lot of uh, homogeny uh, in the study, uh, and certainly heterogeneity makes it difficult to evaluate uh, the impact of the uh, results of this study to um, other patients. The next study was a retrospective analysis of 138 patients. Uh, oral dose, again, had a quite a bit of a range. Uh, suspension with sorbitol was administered. And the mean change compared to control was only a negative 0.14 milliequivalents, which is not a substantial change uh, with a drug that's supposed to uh, have a positive impact on serum potassium levels. The next study was a prospective analysis of six hemodialysis patients, and it had no effect on serum potassium. Uh, some of the details are here, but you can simply see straight lines if it was resin alone versus sorbitol and resin uh, over a 12-hour time frame. Uh, these six patients did not have any change in serum potassium. The next was a prospective randomized single-blind study, uh, and in 97 patients with chronic kidney disease, they were treated with the agent for three days. Uh, there was a reduction in serum potassium of 1.5 milliequivalents per liter at day three. Uh, but these patients had a significant rate of adverse effects. They had uh, a lot of GI effects, and they actually had an increase in blood pressure, uh, presumably due to the sodium burden uh, that this agent uh, provides patients. The next one was a prospective, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. This was 33 patients with CKD. Mean GFR was 20, so these patients were stage 4 CKD. Potassium was 5.2 on average. The dose is 30 grams. It was mixed with water and not sorbitol. Uh, and after a week of therapy, uh, there was a, approximately a one mil equivalent uh, per liter decrease in serum potassium. It showed a better uh, reduction uh, with a week of therapy. Increased rate of adverse effects, as you might imagine, but it's a very small sample size. And a very particular, uh, and patients with CKD stage four, a very small number of patients uh, with a very specialized disease. So what are the concerns uh, regarding safety of SPS? So the incidence of colonic necrosis has been something that uh, people have been talking about for the last couple of years. Uh, there's not a lot of great evidence here, um, but it is consistent. Um, and you have a series of uh, retrospective um, studies along with a systematic review of case reports. Uh, each one of these, again, it's rare uh, to see uh, some of these um, um, included uh, preparations with 33% sorbitol. Some of these cases were without sorbitol. Uh, overall, it's anywhere from uh, 0.14 to 0.4% uh, incidence. And so the risk is quite um, low, but still quite um, significant in the sense that uh, when this does occur, uh, it is a substantial uh, concern for patients. As far as drug interactions are concerned, uh, the FDA um, issued a um, letter uh, a couple of years ago uh, looking at the fact that they were concerned about this drug and the amount of drug interactions it may uh, have. And so uh, based on that, they were uh, asking for drug um, interaction studies with the agent, um, but at the very least, the patients and prescribers should separate dosing of this agent um, by at least six hours. Um, as far as I could find, uh, there's only a, 
about three uh, reports which um, talk about drug interactions in a, a study format, uh, and those were uh, crotiapine, uh, lithium, and iron studies, which showed uh, consistently a reduction in um, absorption or exposure to the uh, agent. So in summary, there are really no good rigorous clinical trials that determine efficacy and safety. It takes several hours uh, to see an effect, uh, really no uh, effectiveness in emergent hyperkalemia. Uh, we're not entirely sure how effect effectiveness uh, is measured when not combined with sorbitol. Uh, I think there are significant safety concerns and there's a question of drug interactions and certainly spacing around um, other medications that um, uh, patients need uh, to consider. So let's switch gears and talk about some of the newer agents that are on the market. And so this is Petiramir, which is first to market um, between the two that I'm going to discuss today. Uh, it's another um, oral potassium ex exchange resin. It is not absorbed. It doesn't degrade. Its primary effect is in the colon. It does come in powder packets. Um, which need to be mixed, um, and there are some specific mixing instructions uh, in how a patient is going to take it, um, which uh, may complicate regimens a little bit um, to some extent. It does need to be refrigerated. However, once it's out in room temperature, it is stable for three months. But some of those storage concerns may be a, a little bit problematic for some pharmacies uh, in terms of the space that they have in their fridge for some of the boxes. Uh, it's available as a number of different doses. Uh, it's given once a day, uh, and you titrate it weekly. Uh, the cost is uh, higher uh, for 30 packets. So again, the burden to the patient may be higher, but depends on their insurance coverage uh, and what their specific copay is going to be. There was initially uh, some thought that you may need to um, consider giving it with or without food, but in the tourmaline trial illustrated here in this particular graph, um, there was no difference in terms of the impact of serum potassium uh, taking it with food or without food. So there's really no concern about um, when this is taken in relation to um, your diet. There are three primary trials that uh, are important to consider when um, thinking about the efficacy and safety of the drug. And um, those are the AMASYST, OPAL, and PEARL trials. And the GEMS are here just to kind of help uh, guide your uh, learning and understanding of the uh, typical trials here. Um, the AMASYST trial was a patient a population with diabetes um, mellitus. Uh, these patients have diabetic nephropathy as well. They had stage 3 and 4 CKD. They were all hyperkalemic. They were on RAS inhibitors. And this was a year-long trial. Uh, the result is that all patients who are on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or the combo, the majority were on spironolactone as well, uh, and it was effective. Uh, the, that potassium was maintained for 52 weeks, uh, but if you stopped the drug, it started to go up. The OPAL uh, trial was uh, patients that had stage 3 and 4 CKD, hyperkalemic, again, similar um, uh, therapies on board. Again, all patients were on ACE inhibitors. It was effective, um, and the most common adverse effect in this particular trial was constipation uh, in 11% of the patients. The PEARL trial was a patient population with heart failure. Uh, they all had chronic heart failure. Uh, they all had a reason to be on spironolactone. Um, and so it was a four-week trial and showed that with uh, the addition of pteromere, the incidence of hyperkalemia was lower uh, and certainly a benefit in those with CKD and heart failure. GI-related adverse effects in 21% of the participants. So let's talk a little bit in more detail on this. In this trial, this study was simple, I think. It was a very appropriately dura uh, duration of the trial, uh, a year-long trial. And what this graph shows that you shows you is that the drug actually works. Potassium is above 5, um, uh, mild and moderate hyperkalemia. And uh, within a day, the potassium is down and within normal range uh, and some bump after the end of the trial when the drug was discontinued, but certainly not above pre-study values. Opal, similar story, potassium goes down. The drug works works effectively and works nicely. It doesn't matter whether it was mild, moderate, or severe hyperkalemia. All patients were down in the normal range uh, during this particular trial. In terms of concomitant therapy uh, in OPAL, you can see that in placebo, you had 62% that had hyperkalemia compared to 16% while they're on drug. And the vast majority of patients on the were able to maintain their therapy with RAS inhibitors, whereas 
less than half were able to do so if they were on the placebo. So again, this goes back to the concept I mentioned earlier, and that is uh, it's important for patients to maintain these therapies uh, to treat some other diseases. So the, the concept of this is an additional agent we add on board to uh, allow freedom of using RAS inhibitors uh, to treat their diabetic nephropathy, their heart failure, what have you. The PEARL trial, again, this is the heart failure trial. This is, uh, again, uh, spironolactone was started in both these patient populations, and you can see that um, despite the addition of spironolactone at different dosages, an increase here half the way through the study, uh, the patients on pteromere were able to maintain potassium levels in a normal range, whereas the patients that did not have the agent, uh, their potassium levels went up um, above uh, the hyperkalemic um, threshold. Some additional benefits of pteromere, which is interesting, is that, and again, these are um, this is sort of off-label, um, certainly, but something worth watching uh, over the next few years, is that serum aldosterone levels went down um, in mild and moderate hyperkalemia, uh, and as a as a result, uh, you saw blood pressures actually going down by quite a big. Um, number, I think. If you look at some of the blood pressure um, agents and what the uh, blood pressure uh, results are, uh, these are comparable, I think, to, to a number of different agents. So again, additional benefit, blood pressure went down, which I think is a benefit. Uh, initially, uh, there was some concern about drug interactions with pteromere. Um, that has been somewhat uh, tempered. Uh, they did a number of trials. They showed that these particular agents had a significant interaction. Uh, when they, these were all in vivo trials, uh, they looked at actual patients. They picked 12 medications that were high on their list, and of those 12, only three really came out on top, Cipro, Floxacin, Levothyroxine, and Metformin. Uh, and really, in general, there's a low risk of drug-drug interactions. Uh, the recommendation in the package insert is to separate it by three hours before and after other, other medications, uh, but this really kind of showed that there's really only three that we're concerned about. So in summary, uh, it does take several hours for the um, reduction in potassium. It occurs within seven hours, the full effect in days, and certainly as you titrate the dose. Uh, we certainly don't know if it's going to really be all that helpful in emergent hyperkalemia. And um, we can certainly, if we dose it too high, um, we can cause uh, the reverse in hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. Um, we keep an eye on drug interactions. Uh, the most notable ones are, uh, were mentioned. It does have a higher cost, so that might have an impact on patients' ability to take the med, and it does have some specific um, details regarding storage, mixing, and administration. Next agent is sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, uh, or ZS9. Uh, this had a long road um, to get approved. There are some uh, manufacturing issues uh, that were identified by the FDA, uh, but ultimately in um, May of 2018, it was approved. Uh, this has um, another exchange resin. Uh, this one uh, exchanges uh, sodium and hydrogen ions for potassium, and um, it is uh, available as a powder. There was some initial discussion of whether or not they would make a dissolvable tablet. That Who knows if that will actually happen, but at least at this point, um, it's a, um, a suspension. There are two primary trials that you should concern yourself with. First is a uh, harmonized trial, which is a phase three uh, randomized double bind placebo control trial in patients with uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, they were randomized to three different doses. There was an open label phase. Uh, those that actually uh, achieved normal kalemia were randomized to a 28 day or four week study. And the vast majority actually uh, achieved normal kalemia. The results that patient, most patients were on RAS inhibitors. They all, majority had CKD. Uh, it was effective. Adverse effects were comparable to placebo. But if you push the dose to the higher end, uh, some patients got edema. In the PACM trial, this is again a, a similarly designed trial. Uh, patients had stage 3 CKD, uh, and potassiums were ranged between 5 and 6.5. This was a dose ranging trial. Doses were a little bit lower uh, than the other trial. The majority maintained a normal serum potassium. The first decline really occurred within the first 48 hours. Uh, and again, adverse event rates were similar to placebo. This is the effect on potassium here. You can see within hours, um, really, uh, the 10-gram dose given at different intervals here, 
really had a marked decrease in uh, potassium right off the bat. And so this is the reason why some people might start thinking whether or not it might be used in the emergency department setting as a, as a combination to the uh, typical therapies we give for acute hyperkalemia. Now that is certainly off-label at this point, but it's something that works uh, fairly quickly, uh, certainly quicker than the other agents. Uh, when you look at uh, the types of patients in, these, in this trial, um, it didn't matter if you had CKD, what your GFR was, if you had heart failure, diabetes, taking RAS, or what your baseline potassium level was. Potassium in every instance went down to the normal range. And again, here we have a reduction in serum potassium in each instance, whether it was uh, placebo, uh, sorry, a ZS9 of 5 grams or 10 grams, uh, they had a reduction in potassium that was significant. Uh, it certainly shows a dose response here. Uh, so the more you give, the more impact you'll have on serum potassium levels. When we looked at adverse effects, um, they're very comparable uh, to the placebo uh, in terms of adverse effects. In fact, in um, uh, some of the GI effects, the percentage of uh, consultation was actually higher on the placebo patients uh, compared to the treatment patients. Um, edema did come up here um, as the dose went up. Edema certainly became an issue, uh, but not, was not something identified in other trials of this agent, uh, but something to keep an eye on. I, obviously, when you're exchanging potassium for sodium and sodium is getting absorbed, that's something to be uh, at least aware of. Again, tolerability is comparable to placebo, no treatment-related serious effects. Lower rates of GI uh, compared to placebo, uh, numerically higher uh, with edema, but did not require treatment uh, in uh, half the patients. And most of the patients that had edema uh, had a peripheral edema only and were able to complete the trial. Uh, because the drug um, does lower potassium, there was a risk of hypokalemia um, with the higher doses, uh, and they resolved with some dose adjustments. As far as drug interactions are concerned, in vitro uh, studies were done, 39 drugs were tested, 30, 23 had some measurable interaction. Most of that had to do with the fact that the pH was changed, uh, the pH went up in the GI tract. When they switched that to in vivo studies, um, nine of those uh, 23 drugs were, uh, were tested um, and said uh, that there's some degree of, um, of interaction. When you looked at that a little bit uh, further, you saw um, a change in terms of the impact of um, uh, the absorption of the drug. An increase in exposure was seen where those drugs were weak acids, so drugs like furosemide and torvastatin, there was an increase in exposure. For those that drugs that are weak bases, you'll see a decreased exposure. And three drugs demonstrate no uh, change, and that and those include drugs that you might expect, like levothyroxine, which often has a lot of drug interactions. So the final slide here, and that is, we have these new binders. We want to think about integrating them into clinical practice. I think there's some effort that needs to occur with respect to getting coverage by the insurers, some some work that needs to be done by uh, the healthcare team. Uh, to make sure that these patients are uh, given this opportunity to be on drugs that I think are much more safe and much more effective. I think uh, in terms of hospital formularies, that's going to depend on uh, some budget and formulary decisions in terms of whether or not they're going to put them on formulary. But in my experience, most hospitals have had um, added one or both of these agents to the uh, formulary. Uh, Pateromir requires specific storage, mixing administration considerations, uh, but it can be taken with or without food, so counseling becomes important for the agent. Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, uh, initial dose uh, is three times a day for up to 48 hours, followed by a once daily dose. I think there's some going to be some things in terms of patients switching from one and other in terms of what the dose comparison is, um, but those are some important concepts. Um, Finally, in the last uh, couple seconds here, you'll notice in this particular graph, you'll see that the um, volume of different types of uh, studies that have been done with both of these agents compared to all the other agents we've had historically for decades. Um, and I think it's safe to say that the Tiramir and uh, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate have quite a bit of literature to support their use in clinical practice. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, Dr. Cannon is going to uh, finish off this webinar for you. I uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you, Dr. Grabe.
uh, with that, I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about some recommendations for pharmacists. Uh, and I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, formulary, uh, some of the management considerations. I think a lot of what we do in pharmacy today uh, goes beyond just clinical. Uh, but I think when we break it down at the highest level, we run into basically three categories. We, we have the clinical portion of it. What is the efficacy? What's the safety of the treatments? What are the economics of it? Uh, I don't think there's anything we do today where we, we, we can avoid talking about the economics, but what are, what are the treatment costs? And then what's appropriate utilization? Uh, and then when it comes to the patient, how do we make sure the patient's adherent to treatment? And then how do we help them through the administrative portion of this? And I think even uh, if you go back to Dr. Graves' last slide where he talked about specialty pharmacy, uh, we're going to see that most of these new treatments require some kind of prior authorization. Uh, how do we help patients through those, those administrative types of things? So many of us are involved in formulary decision making. And, and so uh, what's the evidence for the formulary decisions that we make? And, and we've got some challenges and we've got some opportunities. And I think many times as pharmacists, we sit back and uh, we say we don't have the evidence or we don't have what we need. And I think we have a critical role in making sure that we, we pull together all of that information. Some of the challenges that we're facing right now, though, is the rapid pace of innovation. We don't have a lot of regulation in some of these areas. And then, especially as we start talking about evidence levels, we've got different definitions. What are the opportunities? And I think one of the big opportunities for us as pharmacists is how do we improve the synthesis of evidence? How do we bring stakeholders together? I think many times we practice in silos uh, and don't bring the appropriate stakeholders together. Um, and then how do we work together to support and increase the number of comparative studies? In, in looking at a formulary, and I, and I think in the past, we, we've driven our formularies by class. Uh, if you look at insurance formularies, they've been tiered. Uh, so you have tiered copayments. Uh, you've got step therapy, and then you've got a lot of high-cost drugs that have prior authorization. In my mind, where we need to go is we pay for what works. So let, let's, let's move towards value-based designs. Let's make sure that we target the therapy that's appropriate for patients, and then, and, and probably not specific to hyperkalemia, but in, in many other areas, we, we know that we're going to have companion diagnostics that are going to help drive uh, that treatment. Uh, as pharmacists, we play a vital role in really coordinating care, and I think uh, given that some of the new treatments are only going to be available in specialty pharmacy or in specific pharmacies, there's a real need uh, for us to make sure that we have integration. We ensure the right drug, the right time, but then we also need to ensure that the patient gets it in the right place uh, so that we don't delay access uh, to treatment. Given that some of these new treatments that we've discussed today are available in specialty pharmacy uh, or only available in specialty pharmacy, I, one of the things I thought I would uh, just point out or, or review quickly was the fact that uh, a lot of the components that exist within specialty pharmacy are designed to help uh, really manage uh, the patient. So increased levels of patient counseling. Uh, many times specialty pharmacies will send a nurse out uh, with the medication for the first dose. Uh, there's a lot of administrative assistance as far as prior authorization, coordination of billing and things with uh, insurance companies, a lot of patient training, uh, refill reminders, and, and while they're available at, at just about every pharmacy now, uh, that is something that I think is going to be critical. And then adverse effect management, and, and what you see now with a lot of specialty pharmacies, uh, and the one within the integrated system where I work, uh, it, they, they practice out of the same electronic medical record that the physician does. So as we talk about hyperkalemia, uh, being able to access those lab values and and really see what's going on is a critical component. 
there was a letter published uh, in, in the British Journal of Hospital Medicine a couple years ago, actually almost 10 years ago, uh, and, and it was written by a geriatrician. And his point was, can pharmacists help? And what he said was pharmacists see the majority of patients uh, emanating from any number of practice sites. Uh, he said that pharmacists are well placed to identify potential adverse interactions. And it was really amazing to me. The example he used was hyperkalemia. He talked about trimethoprim, which has amyloid like effects, but he talked about the interaction between drugs with amyloid like effects and ACE inhibitors. And he talked about the role of a pharmacist. And I think uh, many times we forget as we're filling prescriptions, as we're going through our day, the importance that some of these interactions may have. Uh, we've got older drugs like spironolactone that also has those amyloride effects. I think many times we think, well, that's an older drug. It's not used very often. One of the things we've seen uh, recently within our area is an increase in use in spironolactone, and it's not being used in primary care. It's being used by dermatologists. And so we know many times, especially dermatology to primary care, uh, we may not have the coordination that we need. That's a vital role or place that pharmacists can step in and fill that gap. So what is the pharmacist's role in the management of hyperkalemia? Well, first, I mean, we need to identify patients that are at risk for drug-induced hyperkalemia and come up with opportunities to manage uh, chronic conditions when somebody is at risk. We need to counsel our patients so that they have sufficient understanding and knowledge as to what the medications they are taking and what they need to monitor. Uh, some of that may be uh, counseling them as to their diet and different things. We need to seek ways to motivate patients to learn more about their disease uh, and, and be active partners in their care. I think if patients aren't taking an active role, it's very difficult for us. But then I think there's also an opportunity for us to be a liaison uh, with dietitians regarding the patient's diet uh, and, and really talk about different sources of potassium that may be going into that patient's body. So what are the lessons we've learned today? Well, SPS, we know that the use is limited. It's got questionable eff efficacy and there are associated adverse drug events that come along with that. Uh, Glutiamir, we know, is effective for the management of hyperkalemia. Uh, we know it's not approved for the emergency management of hyperkalemia. Uh, we do have some adverse drug events that we know are associated with uh, Plutiamir, uh, but not as significant as uh, SPS. We need to separate it from interacting drugs by about three hours. Now, when we talk about sodium zirconium, uh, we don't have any long-term studies. Uh, it appears that it is effective for acute management onset within a few hours, but it's not indicated for the emergency management of hyperkalemia. So in conclusion, hyperkalemia is a common uh, complication in patients with chronic kidney disease, uh, acute kidney injury, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We know there's certain medications that are gonna increase the risk of hyperkalemia. Uh, as we've talked about, SBS has questionable efficacy and there are safety concerns. And then as we talk about the newer agents, uh, platyamir or sodium zirconium, they're gonna be more selective for potassium, but we also know that there will be some additional administrative burden as some of these are going to require special distribution, handling, mixing, and uh, probably prior authorization from an insurance company. With that, that concludes uh, my portion of the presentation, and we will move into our question and answer period of the program today. Thank you. Uh, we'll jump right into the questions. Uh, Dr. Grape, the, the first uh, 
question we get is uh, a, a question asking about, will the new agents affect emergent treatment of hyperkalemia in the ED? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cannon. I think that's uh, a really good question. I, what's interesting about that question is the fact that I think first and foremost, um, the uh, standard um, procedures still are very important, and that is to um, evaluate whether or not the hyperkalemia is having an impact on the, on the uh, heart rhythm. Um, and so an EKG is always uh, recommended initially to evaluate uh, whether or not it's uh, impacted the, uh, um, the heart. And so in that uh, regard, oftentimes uh, what you'll find is that um, uh, calcium gluconate um, is uh, being infused uh, to protect the heart. Uh, in the setting of uh, Q hyperkalemia, uh, followed by uh, perhaps a number of other procedures, which would include uh, perhaps diuretics if the kidneys are functioning, um, insulin to shift potassium to cells. Uh, if the patient has some degree of acidosis, some might consider sodium bicarb. Some have used albuterol, uh, inhaled albuterol, uh, to shift the potassium into cells. And of course, if the kidneys are, are not working, um, consideration of uh, extracorporeal therapy in the form of hemodialysis, perhaps, uh, would be uh, would be in indicated. Um, in all of that, um, and historically, uh, sodium polystyrene sulfonate has often been utilized uh, to help manage the potassium and, and sort of bridge individuals over um, to the point where an underlying diagnosis can be established in terms of what's causing the hyperkalemia. It might be a drug-induced cause, it might be a dietary need, it might be a cause, and a combination of underlying comorbid diseases, often including uh, some disorder in the kidney. And so I think uh, based on that and, and based on the fact that these agents are probably uh, likely to be used in that setting, it may be you may see some of that use, but I would not replace some of the uh, initial therapies for acute hyperkalemia um, uh, just because these agents are available. They just simply don't work that quick uh, to save a person's life. Great. Thank you. Uh, I mean, and, and, and you've touched on this a little bit in, in the acute setting, but, you know, why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, what, what are the treatment options if we're not going to use binding agents? So treatment without binding agents uh, and let me kind of maybe combine that with, um, you know, the question was about a home remedy or prevention. M maybe we, you know, talk about treatment without the binding agents, and then let's talk a little bit about prevention, if you could, Dr. Grave. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think uh, uh, some of the, the background information is important, and, I, you know, knowing that uh, uh, most of the potassium that um, um, you get is, is in your diet. Um, often what we recommend in our clinic is simply a, a very um, restricted potassium diet, um, avoiding foods, uh, beverages, um, and, and other things that might increase p potassium um, uh, exposure. And uh, I think, I think there's, there's a lot of education that goes around uh, what foods and, and such have potassium in them. Um, and that really becomes a, a, a challenge, uh, particularly in light of the fact that a lot of these patients often have other dietary restrictions which uh, make things difficult. So in, inclusion often of a dietitian or nutritionist uh, can be helpful in, in creating a diet that works, that's palatable, that's, that's easy to follow. Uh, beyond that, um, we also, of course, uh, look at uh, drug interactions. Sometimes uh, uh, drugs together might uh, influence the uh, increase of potassium, um, and so we might manage that by using uh, alternative therapies to minimize the exposure. Uh, we may institute using uh, diuretic therapy, and if it's a patient with hypertension, that uh, you know, cert certainly makes sense um, to institute diuretic therapy. Um, uh, but those are probably the biggest things. Some of, you know, I think the home remedies thing, I'm not entirely sure exactly what that would entail. Uh, I think um, really the most home remedy you can do is simply avoid uh, excessive intake of potassium since that's really our major source. Um, and, um, you know, comparing that to what your, you know, ultimately what your kidneys can handle. Great. Hey, uh, you, when you answered the first question, you were talking about in the acute setting uh, using insulin and dextrose infusion. Um, and and we, we got a question, what is the dose and rate of insulin plus dextrose infusion in the emergent situation? Um, and so in regards to um, an insulin infusion, most of the time, uh, I, it, and it's been a long time since I've been in the inpatient setting, uh, 
um, uh, for um, for these patients. Um, the typical um, that I would say is um, some people will use about a 10 unit uh, dose, a bolus dose uh, initially, um, and then um, I kind of do, it sort of bases it um, uh, a little bit on what their what their glucose is going to be. Uh, oftentimes you'll see um, uh, that be sort of titrated uh, along with um, uh, individuals uh, based on whether or not they have diabetes underlying or that they don't have diabetes. Uh, so some people use five or 10 units initially. Um, depending on if they have diabetes, you might use, you know, a dextrose infusion or maybe a D10 uh, as infusion in there. Um, and then they might use, um, you know, uh, bolus is a five to 10 units uh, beyond there. Uh, but it kind of is, is uh, a little bit difficult for me to really fully answer that because I, I'm not sure what the protocols are right now uh, in the hospital, but usually it's a 5 to 10 unit bolus followed by um, uh, a continuous infusion if needed. Great. Um, there was a question here about uh, what fruits might be rich in potassium and then it uh, had a question at the end. Most of the time, it is recommended to take potassium with hypertension. Um, you know, are you familiar with those fruits that may be rich in potassium? Well, I mean, I so the reason there's a, a link between taking potassium-rich foods and hypertension is that um, when you are um, – potassium itself and actually lower uh, blood pressure. And so often when you look at – uh, the DASH diet, uh, the DASH diet, uh, dietary approach to stop hypertension, is is a diet that's heavy in fruits and vegetables, and um, a lot of those uh, vegetables that are citrus-related fruits, uh, such as and, and bananas, uh, things like that. Uh, some of the berries uh, don't have a lot of potassium, so sometimes you'll see um, uh, some of the berries might not have as much potassium. Watermelon does not have a lot of potassium. Uh, so some of those types of fruits uh, might be recommended. Uh, a great source for, of information for this uh, is the National Kidney Foundation, which has a, a pretty robust uh, patient um, pamphlet um, to kind of guide uh, choices um, to get the uh, nutrition they need um, and getting some fruits in the diet. Um, but a lot of this is really um, hinges on what the underlying kidney function is because uh, you know, as as we know, over 90% of the kidney uh, or 90% of the handling of potassium is done by the kidney. So if the kidney's not functioning well and somebody has a high potassium diet, uh, those things don't go well hand in hand. So you ultimately need to really um, uh, link up what your kidney function is to what your overall potassium burden is. That being said, we have patients that have very low kidney function um, that have GFRs less than 15. Um, and have no problem with potassium. So I think it really becomes um, a patient-to-patient -patient thing in terms of what they can what they can eat. And uh, again, I'll, I'll reiterate the, the importance of having a dietitian sort of in the conversation to kind of help manage that. Great. No, thank you, thank you, Dr. Grabe. Uh, you know, I, I think you you point to the the benefit of, of having a multidisciplinary care team, and we know that you know as we pull in a dietitian and a pharmacist and and everything else into the treatment of a patient that that collaboration allows us to deliver better outcomes for our patients. So uh, with that, we will thank everyone for joining us. Uh, and uh, to claim credit for this CE, uh, you can do that directly from the website after the after the program is over. Thank you.